hello to everybody who may be watching out there in YouTube world. That's right. It's one of the last daily chats. Did you all know that? Well, that's the way it's going to be. You have eight more daily chats after tonight. Tomorrow night, and then seven more. We'll do the final next Sunday night to the great cheers of some and the great sadness of others. Uh, Which one are you? I don't know. We like doing these, but we've done it like, I don't know, 150 times now or something like that. Yep. So we do need to bring these daily chats to a close. Now, you might wonder why we're starting at 8.30 rather than 9 tonight. And that is because we're actually recording the podcast, episode 669, um, which is a reference to the new Bill and Ted movie, maybe? I don't know. Did you see the trailer for it? Uh, I've seen a trailer for it. I don't remember 669 being an important number in the trailer. Oh, okay, well, I don't know. I was just That was a dumb joke. But um, I'm... Dumb joke I don't understand. Well, 69 is a pretty big number in the original Bill and Ted. Oh, I, I don't... Uh... Sure, anywho, okay. Anywho, um, I'm hoping that the new one's good, but the trailer does not have me hopeful. Anyhow, sure. Anyhow. Um, all right, so anyway, folks, we're going to be recording the podcast. We're going to start that soon, but we will actually be taking questions from you all as part of our Q&A part of the segment. So, so type those in, or we won't know what you want us to, to say. And talk about <laughs> well you don't type them in yet that part of the uh, show is a bit away yet so that's true all right everything is good on my end i'm ready to go uh i'm i'm all right i've been recording for minutes what is that is that true what have you been waiting oh, for yeah I well because you have to go into thing i just had to test my mic and make sure it was working all right <clears throat> all right let's do it Okay, here we go. The Dice Tower, episode 669. R is not for pirates. Hmm. You know, I have not eaten at Long John Silver's in years. Oh, no, I was thinking of Muppet Treasure Island. That is in the top three Muppet movies? I, I'm willing to accept that. Yeah, but see, you put the Christmas in the top three, and I do not. Oh. I would say The Great Muppet Caper. Okay. And the new Muppet movie, the the reboot movie. The Muppets. And then and then the, the Pirates. Those and are my three Muppet favorites. And then Muppet Treasure Island. Okay. Those are my three favorites. Huh. I like Muppets Take Manhattan as my favorite of the original trilogy. Uh, and then I, I have to go with Muppet Christmas Carol. And The Muppets as well. Uh, of the new generation. Yeah, I can tell you what my least favorite is, is the new Muppet series that premiered that Eric likes that was a ripoff of The Office. Oh, the, the, which was also called The Muppets. There, Eric and I diverged. I, if I don't have music, it ain't The Muppets. They that started is... to put music in. There there were, it, it started to become more like the the show that we loved, Muppets Tonight or the original Muppet show, but it it took so long to get there that I think most of the audience disappeared by the time it got there. Well, we'll see what the new one is like. I am cautiously optimistic. Sure. Welcome to our Muppets podcast. <laughs> I'm Eric Summer. <laughs> I'm Tom Vassell. That's true. That was a lot of Muppet talk. There still is not a good Muppet board game. But, but no. there are some good themed board games out there. Well, if you're listening to this, we're hoping... Probably, I feel pretty confident We're that we will hoping. finish this recording. The reason <laughs> uh, I'm hoping, well, the yeah, I'm hoping more than you because at this moment, a mere hundred or so miles away from me is a hurricane. Oh, well, yes, then I'm definitely hoping. Yes, it's sliding right by. It looks like it's gonna miss Miami for the most part. Actually, it's heading your direction, Eric. Oh, goody. Yeah, I think they're they're actually saying it's going to hit Rhode Island, which should be just missing me as well. But that, that does mean we're going to get some it significant It should be rain. a much lessened storm at that point in time. Sure. Um, also, uh, there. let's see, we are, while we're recording this, we shouldn't even be where we're at. No, no. It's what irritating. am I doing at home? <laughs> we were, I was eating today and 
And uh, Keddy said, we we should be eating really well right now <laughs> at a restaurant at, <laughs> G- at Gen Con. And that's because yes. Gen Con is now, but Gen Con has been canceled and then said they had Gen Con online, which seemed to yep. go okay. Definitely okay. is not as exciting, obviously, as the real Gen Con. No online con can be. No. Did you see the person who made a replica of the Indianapolis Convention Center out of Minecraft bricks? No. It was fascinating. And it, they actually did a um, a replica of the 2016 exhibit hall. But I, I don't know how to Minecraft. So I, I didn't actually get to explore. I just looked at pictures. They had Cardhala. Uh, they had all this other. The carpet pattern looked the same. It was fascinating. And um, I, I'd love to That's explore that exhibit hall. Was the sure. tower in it? I well, I wanted to know. Like we were there. We had a booth in 2016, right? Uh, and so I don't know what our booth looked like. Whether we had our wasn't that the year we had a 10 by 10 booth and we were squished. It might have been like the very tiny one where we were right next to Chip Theory Games and annoying them tremendously. So I'm curious if if we exist in this Minecraft server. I I don't know. I'm not sure. I haven't had a chance. My my youngest is the Minecraft guy, and I got to figure out how to. Out of Minecraft. My one daughter Minecrafts all the time, and anytime I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really so of parenting. The one thing I really dislike is the uh, talking down answers to questions that are just absolutely. I'm not, you know. I mean, I know dads are sarcastic a lot, but I'll come in and I'll go, "Where are the bad guys that you're supposed to be fighting?" And they're like, "Well, you mu- if you must know, you know." I'm like, "No, well, I mean, sorry, I don't know everything about Minecraft." I'm just, I'm a, I'm an adult. Uh, that, that may just be a situation with that particular daughter of yours. I, it, it I haven't may heard be, that. But do remember my kids play games with me. But anywho, <laughs> so speaking of that, we'll start off by, t- oh, well, actually, before we jump into games, I do will say on that note, on that note, the second last holdout Minecraft? of 2020, uh, no, about Gen Con. Oh. The second last holdout from 2020 is out. Dice Tower Retreat has just been canceled. And ah, they're postponing shucks. it to 2021. Not that this yeah. is any great surprise at this point in time, but I had held out hope. Um, yeah. The only What's thing- the last holdout? Is it PAX? PAX is not yet officially canceled. Wow. Well, they There's- haven't really... They, they tend not to announce, right? They Did they ever announce a date? Well, I, you mean like <laughs> they don't have to cancel because they never are? No, right. they, yeah, uh, no, there's a fax. I, I know we know the dates. Yes, because it's the same dates as PGG Con. Okay. I remember that. Anywho, so Anywho. that's kind of sad news, but good news is we're still talking about board games and lots of cool things um, heading your way. So with that being said, let's start talking about board games. Oh. You know what? I got some more announcements. I really oh, should. Sure. I really should just pile all those in here. First of all, you should maybe follow the script that we I, have. I but. should. I have it written right here. <laughs> well, you know what? For a while, we had a, we had a few things written there that I was just skipping over automatically, <laughs> and because I was too lazy to delete them, and I said, you know, I might talk about them. Now I actually do talk about them. Dice Tower. Now, you want now? a twenty minute podcast about the board game news every week? Check it out. Dice Tower. Now. Um. And I have lots of cool segments and lots of neat things. Secondly, Dice Tower Digest. You want a newsletter? I just finished filling out my part of it today. We send that out on a bi-weekly schedule. We will talk about announcements and things that are going on with the Dice Tower and notify you of videos and different things that we find of interest. Board game news, Kickstarter news, and things like that. You can opt out anytime, and I'll never sell your address to anyone else because I hate that. And finally, Dice Tower t-shirts. I'm wearing one, actually, but you can't see it. Um, we have superhero t-shirts. Like this one says, it looks like a, a hulked out um, die. And he says, my secret, I'm always gaming. Comfortable <laughs> t-shirts. You can find those on our website. Very nice. All right. We'll finally talk about games. Well, we talk about them like this. Okay, so we talked about there is no Muppet game, but good news, there is a Scooby-Doo game. In fact, this is the second Scooby-Doo game that I've talked about on the podcast, I believe. Did I talk about the first one on the podcast? You did indeed, and I was confused and thought it was this one that you're about to talk about. Well, no, this one is... So, when I talked about the last one, which was an escape room style game, um, I had mentioned that I thought 
that it was going to be a revamping of be, uh, Betrayal House on the Hill. Uh, by the way, right. the, ga- the previous game was Coded Chronicles Scooby-Doo Escape ha- the Haunted Mansion. This one okay. is Scooby-Doo Betrayal at Mystery Mansion that I'm talking about. And this one is a revamping of Betrayal at House on the Hill. Exactly. Do you, are you? Have you played it? No, but I'm agreeing with you. Oh, okay. Well, you agree with me a lot in a very sarcastic way, which makes me feel sad. But Of course I do. <laughs> so in this game, uh, you can have up to five players, and they play the five different members of the gang. And you are starting. It's If you've played Betrayal House on the Hill, there's a lot of similarities. You're exploring around in this mansion, and you find different events and things that are spooky. Not super spooky. Scooby-Doo spooky. And then you will eventually start a haunt, it's called. And this will happen through some random dice rolls. You'll pick a card at the beginning of the game based on how hard you want the haunt to be. And then depending on what item, this will split into different haunts. There are 25 haunts included with the game. When you start the haunt, one, you'll choose, you can randomly pick, or you can just choose someone, and that person says, you know what, I want to play the bad guys. I want to play the monsters, or at least the person wearing the mask. And then their person gets locked in a broom closet by accident. All right, so if I'm Shaggy and I want to be the monsters, (laughs) Shaggy gets locked in the broom closet, and I play as the monsters, and everyone else (laughs) plays against me. Okay. And then you just try to accomplish a certain goal. There's no death in this game. There is death and betrayal at House on the Hill. Um, it is, there's no omens because they said um, the uh, Mr. Gang doesn't know what omens are. They, uh, they're clues. You know, they, mm. they know what clues are. Okay. And it is incredibly more family friendly. It is also incredibly more oriented towards a younger crowd. That doesn't mean that mm. a bunch of adults could not play it. You could. But it's definitely good for families. One of the things I particularly liked about this is recently I started playing Betrayal Legacy with my kids. Okay. Which is essentially Betrayal at House on the Hill with the Legacy version. Yes. And I'm finding that the number one humongous problem of this game is when someone becomes a traitor, you send them out of the room to go read the traitor tome, and then they have questions. And you're like, well, I can't really look at those because I'm on the other team. Blah, blah, blah. In this one, you do not have to do that. In the Scooby-Doo one, you can just clearly lay out and say, this is what the bad guy is trying to do. This is what Hmm. the good guys are trying to do. You can keep them separate if you want to, but it's not a big thing to show them off. They say that in the rules. Okay. And so if you have kids and you've wanted to play Betrayal House on the Hill and just were a little worried that was a little gory or weird or supernatural spooky, this one is good, especially if you like Scooby-Doo. I've watched a few of the, I I was going to say new cartoons. I don't know how new they are, but I I know they're not going to last a few decades. Um, They're Mm -hmm. really, they're really quite well done. And, and I like how this, this definitely brings that vibe out. Like we played Mm -hmm. one and one person, the bad guy was a a puppeteer trying to have puppets scare an innocent bystander. An evil puppeteer. I no. know. And no. I was the evil puppeteer, and I would have won if it weren't for those meddling kids. For those meddling kids. And it actually said that in the book, and that made all of us happy. So <laughs> it's, you know what, though? It's, it's funny because Scooby Doo is a cool IP in that it's one that me and the kids both really like. Hmm. You know, uh, I like Scooby Doo, and, you know, it's from the, I think, it was the 60s, 70s when it started. And yet the kids nowadays know it just as much. You know, there was a movie this year, too. And so that's that's neat that there's a, an IP that everybody enjoys. Cool. So that's Scooby-Doo, Betrayal Mystery Mansion. Great for families. Yeah, I love that um, that you choose who the betrayer is going to be. So you can make the adult in the group or the most experienced one in the group be the betrayer so that everybody else can work together. I like that. And if you have that one kid who's just like dying to be the bad guy, so be it. Yeah, it can be their turn. Cool. First up for me is a game called Control. This is from Pandasaurus Games, and it is spelled like the key on the keyboard, so C-T-R-L. You might be surprised at how many kids actually assume that when you say Control. That they that they just immediately go to the... Like, if you say spell Control, I'd be like C-T-R-L. I don't know. Weird. Well, okay. Sure. Sorry. Anyway, um, that's making me feel old all of a sudden. In Control, Control is an area control game in 3D. Every player is given these block uh, pieces, and um, they 
they all fit together pretty uniformly. Think think Lego bricks only except there's one post on each of these. And uh, there is the, the area that you are controlling is this brick, uh, this cube that has lots of areas where the, um, the, the blocks can plug into. Everybody starts with one block on basically opposite sides of the, uh, the board. This is really a three to four player game, but you can play a two player variant where each player has control of two colors and only one of them uh, secretly scores at the end of the game. Uh, but in addition to having a block at the beginning, you also have a flag. This is a big plastic thing that's a post that sticks out from one of the sides of your pieces. And this post blocks building along that axis. You can't build along there and your opponents can't either. So at the beginning of your turn, you're going to remove your flag and then you have to place one of your bricks adjacent to one of your other bricks that's already on the board. And then you build in a straight line two other bricks, two other blocks. And uh, there's rules about how these wrap around and move over other objects. And they basically sort of travel along the surface of the play uh, sphere, uh, cube, play cube. And, um, and then you will have extended your area. And then you finish your turn by placing your flag in whatever direction you want off of one of your pieces, thereby blocking a particular direction, but it's only one direction. Uh, this continues until everyone has run out of pieces, and then your score is how many faces are visible from all five directions that you can look at the, the cube. Uh, you don't look from the bottom. There's, there's one side that's always on the table, and so you'll look at the four uh, basic sides and then up above and count how many faces of each color you see most wins. Uh, if you are playing, as I mentioned, the two-player game, you're given two of those colors at the beginning, and you'll secretly choose one at the beginning, and that's the one that's going to score you points at the end. But you get to move with both, so you can, uh, you know, bluff, you can try and block with the other uh, color, and keep your opponent guessing as to which one you're going for. I have only played the two-player game with my son. I would like to try this with more players, because the two-player game... I don't know. It was a little, a little limiting. Um, I, I would, um, it, it just sort of, you almost have to guess which of the two colors your, your opponent is going for and hope that you're blocking the right thing. It's very hard to cover everything. Um, but this does give me a, a Rumus or a, uh, um, Pueblo vibe, um, where you're, you're trying to maneuver around a 3d space and keep certain faces visible and block other faces. And um, the modular nature of the pieces, you're, you're basically making a straight line each turn as you place your pieces, but they wrap around in weird ways. Um, and visualizing that can be a little tricky. There were a few times that my son went to make a move and I, I said, no, you can't do that. Or you're, you know, you're going the wrong right. direction or you're skipping over a piece. Um, and it took a little bit to, to visualize how that all worked. And the actual physical nature of this, well, I have to applaud them for the engineering that it required to make this. And I, it looks like this has gone through a lot of iterations to make the pieces easy to remove and plug together and stay together on the table. It is still a little fiddly in, in, um, what, you know, you have to sort of push these pieces in with a little bit of force, um, and keep them aligned. But then when you try and stick your flag in, if you don't support the structure that you're trying to put pressure against, you might end up like knocking everything out of whack. And that happened a few times with my son as well. And he, he was getting a little frustrated by the end because he would, he'd be like, I know what I want to do, but I can't physically get the flag to go in without breaking it. So it, it takes some right. finesse to, um, to control control. But I, I do, I'm reserving like final judgment until I can play this as a three or a four player game. Um, because the two, it, it just felt a little weird only working with two. I want to have more, um, I don't want to have the dummy colors. Basically. I want to be actually competing against everyone that's on the board. So if I've, that makes sense. I play control without the dummy players and I like it. Uh, my only issue would be what you said. You got to be careful when you put the blocks in. Mm -hmm. uh, we sat and talked about it afterwards, and I was trying to figure out how they could make the blocks. And I'm not sure you could make them as that's as strong as you'd want them to be. Yep. Um, the flag. There's actually like a there's a notch. So there there's um in in one of the the recessed areas of the piece, it has sort of a diagonal part. It's not like a solid square that you're plugging the post into. 
It's sort of a, there's a diagonal cutout. And I think they did that so it could be removed easily and not stick together and get fused. But it does mean that there are some ways that it can fall apart. All right, so that's Control. That's from Pandasaurus Games, and I believe it's out now. I, I think it just released this week. So today I played some particularly horrific games, oh. um, which I will get to eventually, right? But I mean, one of them was just <laughs> bad in every way, bad component quality, bad rules, bad luck. And in fact, when uh, someone said, well, it wasn't that bad, I said, name something good. And they were like, okay, maybe it wasn't that good. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> and we said, well, before we end, let's play something good. And uh, it was just two people. So I pulled out Overpower. A listener sent me some starter decks for Overpower. Now, I need to teach this to Roy. But Marvel Overpower, which is a fantastic collectible card game, which I talk about a lot. And if you look for the original decks, they're not that expensive. There's a lot of rare cards for the thing. But um, the, I just, I'm not going to go over the whole game. Marvel Overpower is just Marvel superheroes fighting each other. You have a team of four against someone else's four. There's definitely some problems with the game. It can be, you can make decks that are inherently better than other decks. But if you play the starter decks, they're pretty well balanced. But what the game's interesting is, is on your turn, you throw damage at your opponent. They throw damage back at you. But you bid, or you venture, that's a, the term in the game, a certain number of missions if you think you're going to do more damage than your opponent. And you can bid and then immediately concede a round, which means you let them win the missions, but you you don't take any damage. Mm -hmm. And that concept is not done in almost any games. It's been 20 years now since this, or more, almost 25 years, I think it is 25 years since this game was released. And I have yet to see games that allow you to kind of bet on the results of your fighting somebody else. It's a cool concept. Uh, in fact, I got so enamored playing today, uh, thanks to these stutter decks, and I was like, I must, do I have any other overpower? So I went and looked through my very small collection of games at this point in time, found all my overpower <laughs> cards, pulled mm -hmm. them out, and then said, oh, wow, we got overpower cards, and oh, man, I wish I had more. So then I went to eBay and was, <laughs> <laughs> I know, <laughs> but I'm looking for like someone's whole collection to buy, so I'm still hunting that, right, watching for that. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know. I'm just saying this game has some legs to it. Overpower. Okay. So that is another game that I played. Is, not new. Not new. But it is fantastic. Uh, my next one is, is new. Uh, this is the Zorro Dice Game. This comes from Pull the Pin Games. Can I stop which, here real quick? Before we yeah. jump into this game, I really dislike this branding. Oh. I, yeah? It is. It's odd. So... Pull the Pin used to be Overworld Games, and there, I think that this comes from the packaging that they have put this in. It's it's a long, skinny box with a ring on one side, and like then the it's the ones that you hang pin. up on shelves. Sure. Right. So so and these these can be hung on a on a display shelf. They, I guess if it's wrapped, they could be. Yes, uh, and then. Once it's unwrapped, you can you pull on this little ring and it slides out of a sleeve and then has a magnetic closure that opens up. Um, yeah, it is an odd brand. I guess they're like, you know, explode the fun. Pull the pin. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just don't. I mean, you combine that with the unfortunate bad, in my opinion, the bad graphic design of these games. It doesn't help. I have mm. not played this game, which you're about to talk about, but it doesn't look appealing. But maybe you'll okay. change my mind. Uh, so yes, pull the pin is also now the makers of uh, good cop, bad cop. There's a new edition of that game mm -hmm. that's in the pull the pin packaging. Back to Zorro though. In the Zorro dice game, uh, it is a competitive game in which you are competing to be the next Zorro. Zorro is going to retire, and you are trying to uh, to be the hero that takes over for Zorro. You will do this by completing various tasks. There will be several on the board at the beginning, and they require a combination of dice. Uh, die results in order to complete. Uh, each one of these will also have a piece of equipment that's been uh, drawn from a deck and put under them. So if you complete that task, you will then get that piece of equipment. And this allows you to uh, get extra die results or re-roll certain die results, stuff like that. On your turn, you're going to take these six black uh, Zorro dice, hero dice, 
and they have different die results on them. And you'll do the Yahtzee thing where you get three uh, rolls and you can keep as many as you want. And you're trying to get this uh, this assortment of symbols in order to complete the uh, the goal that you're going for. You, however, can ask for help at the beginning of this this turn. So you can say, I'm going for this location and I'm ready to roll. Does anyone want to help me? Kind of like Cosmic Encounter. Anybody want to help me? Uh, and you can choose one person to help you. Uh, and then you can use any of their equipment that they have in front of them. And you will get a fourth roll after if you were unsuccessful after your three rolls, you can hand whatever dice you want to your teammate and they roll a fourth roll to see if you succeed. If you got help and you do succeed, you get the little mission card in front of you and you get the piece of equipment that was there and your helper gets a, a blind draw from the deck. Free equipment if you helped out. So that's a kind of a neat uh, system where you're, you know, do you want to help? Do you want to help somebody at this point if they're just going to get further along in the game or do you, um, do you just want the stuff? Um, as you continue around the table, the um, missions are color coded. There's four different colors. And once you get a second mission, completed mission of the same color, you will then gain a hero die that is off to the side of the board and face a scoundrel of that color. So there at the beginning of the game, there is a villain and a scoundrel in blue, and then a villain and a scoundrel in red, yellow, and green. And once you have two blue missions, well then, you get that hero die, which now you can roll on any of your future turns. You'll now be rolling seven dice instead of six. And the scoundrel then goes against the next player. That is the mission they must face. If they succeed, they're going to get a special piece of equipment. If they fail, the scoundrel moves to the next player in sequence. It could make it all the way back to you if everybody fails. But whoever does defeat the scoundrel gets a piece of cool equipment. Once a second or a, the, either somebody gets their third blue or whatever color they're going for, or somebody else gets a pair of blue, that brings out the villain, who is a special bad guy that everybody has to face, and that will end the it game once a villain generic. comes out. Who is this villain? Uh, well, it depends on who the villain, like there's a blue villain and a red villain and a yellow villain and a <sighs> green villain. So they, I mean, they have personalities and special rules that you have to face. And if you get the expansion, which is, there's also an expansion for this, they have more villains and scoundrels that you mix all together and face. But the base game just has one of each. And so if you're facing the red villain, then they have special rules. You may not be able to use certain equipment, whatever. Everybody faces the final villain. If only one player survives against the final villain, they win. If more than one player or no players go against, uh, beat the beat the final villain, then there is a duel to determine who is the final winner. Ow. Then you do your same three, um, three rolls, and you can use all your equipment, and you're just looking for sword results on the dice, and whoever gets the most wins the game. And based on Tom's immediate response, Tom doesn't like the end game, and I think I have to agree here. The I end game is weird. It's, it's, it was triumphant. I played this a few times with the family and with my parents and kids. They understood what was going on. Uh, you know, the, the procedure of this game was fine. Um, my dad thought it was a little complicated, but I, I think he just didn't understand how equipment worked. But that end game, when only one player defeated the bad guy, that was sort of triumphant. It's like, yes, I am definitely the winner. But then when there was a duel, then it's just sort of like this roll off. And it's, Getting die results that lead to swords is different than the die results you need to fight the villain. And it feels like you're competing. It's sort of the free uh, the free kick way to decide the World Cup. It's a different set That's of skills. That's everyone's favorite way to decide the World Cup. Oh, it is. Uh, it's a different set of skills than you have been building up the entire time. So do you try and get equipment to play for the duel to try and win? Um, it, it just it did feel odd. Um, however, my youngest really enjoyed it and wanted to play more. Uh, so he really liked it. I, I'm sort of middling on it because I really don't like that end game. And the dice are tiny. In order to fit in this small box, it, there are some pretty small dice. And my, my parents had trouble deciphering what the, um, the, the die results were. Um, and, and, and what is that? Is that a jump? Is that a mask? What is that? Oh, and there is a cardboard mask inside the box that is only for taking a selfie when you win. 
Anyway, that's the Zorro dice game. I am not from, sold on this from you. I, mean, I, 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 it looks, I don't think, yeah. Here, it, that, that end game is odd. The, see, the, the problem that I have with the game is that it looks, when I look at it, I'm like, this doesn't excite me. Mm. And I'm like hoping that the game, but I don't know, that graphic design really threw me off looking at it. Small Zorro dice game. I want a Zorro board game mm. where I can run around and rescue people and slice I mean, it didn't. It didn't feel like, like doing a mission didn't feel like doing a mission. It's just, well, here's this combination of dice I'm going for. And you sort of base it off of maybe I have a piece of equipment that gets me a rose result. And so I'll go for that. Um, it, it just didn't, it didn't feel like I was doing anything Zorro-like. All righty. Well, that's enough gaming talk for now. Let's jump over to Mr. Jeff Engelstein where he can tell us what he thinks of us. <laughs> all right i'm gonna save i forgot about the interview so we uh oh sure so we all that's why you only had two yeah we'll cut those we'll, we'll just move those other games till next time if i remember that's which fine. i won't that's fine um i was just i just wanted to talk about how tabletop simulator like practically crashed on that day um because so many people were it was like the first it was wednesday night so it was the first day of Gen Con online and a whole bunch of people were trying to play games and it just tabletop simulator pick up like mad. Mm -hmm. For those of you watching on video, you may be wondering why we're not talking to you. We are talking to you right now. We're in the middle of recording our podcast. That's why we started early at 830. We'll be going probably all the way up till 10 and more. So don't fret. Don't fret. And we'll be taking your questions very, very soon. So get ready to ask them. Be be prepared. And we'll answer some of your questions. Then we'll be recorded onto the podcast. So ask good questions, thoughtful questions, neat questions, different yeah, questions. No bad, no bad questions. Stop with the bad questions. <laughs> Sorry, I just I don't want to save this where the audiobooks go. I don't want to see where the audiobooks go. Mm-hmm. 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 You know, parodies of that song are primed. They're good stuff. Yeah, sorry. It's just the first one that came to my mind. What do you want me to do? I don't know. All right. <clears throat> How's the weather? It is fine so far. I don't know if the rain's hit us yet, but it looks like the hurricane is going to miss us quite Nicely. Nice. We finally had the heat wave break, which is good. Let me pull up the uh, current. Oh, there's another one forming. <laughs> Yay! So, Tom, did you want to comment on uh, Jeff, or are we I going don't. straight we'll into the? We'll just jump right into the thing. Uh, give me a second here. Sure. Do you, Do you want to introduce the interview? Uh, yeah. In fact, I'm going to just do the whole thing. Because the interview it. is going to be part of it. I need to open that first, then it'll work. There we go. Yeah, it looks like the hurricane is just almost abreast of us now. Mm. However, it is quite a bit out. It's closer to the Bahamas than it is to us. So it looks like we are just going to get missed by it. Unless it makes a hard left, please don't. <laughs> that would be bad. All right, here we go. I'm Gator rolling. Dave says there's two more storms coming. Shut up, Gator Dave. <laughs> All right, here we go. This podcast is sponsored by the op. It's specifically Hughes and Cues. You've heard me talk about it. You've seen me play it on the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that's really fun for the whole family to play. And uh, I really like it because, I don't know, as a kid, I used to steal all those paint swaths from the store and take them home and <laughs> look at them and determine the color from my room. But I was told that bright red was not a good color for the inside <laughs> of a room. I disagreed. And now that I'm grown up, my wife has said that's also true for grown ups. <laughs> but anyway, if you like those colors and trying to differentiate between them, that's what this is. A, this is it's really, really fun. And in fact, on this particular show, we have a contest that we're going to be running. But before we tell you about this contest um, for this game, 
that has 480 colors um, on a six-fold game board. Uh, I have an interview with the designer, Scott Brady. So we sat down to talk together, and here it is. All righty. Then we come back for the interview. All righty. Well, the interview's over, but the contest is just beginning. Folks, you can enter to win one of four copies of this a new and award-winning party game, Hughes and Q's. Contest runs from August 4th to August 19th. Limit one entry per email address, U.S. and Canada entries only. All you have to do now, this one's a little bit different than normal. You need to visit HTTPS, blah, 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 WooBox, that's W-O-O-B-O-X dot com, backslash, A-G-N-E-3-D. Now, I know that's a lot to remember, so check out our show notes for the podcast, and we'll have the link there. And you can find it and go there and answer some questions, and you'll enter this to win four copies, which is pretty good odds. So if you think about it and you're like, I don't know if I'll win one, then don't enter making it better for everyone else. <laughs> Wait, that's not the way I'm supposed yeah, to, to that, push no, that, it's right? Not, no. It's not uh, the usual call to action, no. <laughs> Stay away! It's mine! All righty. Well, with that being said, let's get to questions. For those of you on video, if you notice, the contest doesn't start to August 4th and 19th, so if you go to that link, that link's dead right now, so you have to wait till then. Dead Sorry. Me. Can't go. All right. This is where you start asking questions, folks, and we will answer some of these on the podcast. Try to make them about gaming if you can. <laughs> or Muppets. No, it's a not Muppet Muppet. I don't want to talk about the Muppets. All right, I'm just I'm gonna start recording in a second, Eric. I'm just waiting for the uh sure. the questions to pop on. I'm gonna keep recording because I uh, want all of this. You do, you wanna remember it? Yep. Ah, the good old I days. I still have that clip where where you say, I agree with everything Eric just said. And I stick it in at opportune moments. Mm. Well, that's fine. Oh, I should keep that one too. I don't. Where are you going to use that one? Wow. Well, that's fine. That's I think anytime. fine. <laughs> All right. I'm not seeing any good questions. I'm not starting to get at least one good question. <laughs> so we may be here all night. Well, if we're I have not, to. We're not going to talk until you give us a good question. <laughs> Is it true I screamed at Baby Yoda this week? I did, because Baby Yoda scared me. Stare at you. So you give us a good question. You, I'm talking to you. Ah, okay, here we go. Let's go. All right, question time. So, folks, we're doing something different today. We're recording this show live in front of a YouTube studio audience who you can't hear, Ooh. but you know they're there. A and YouTube studio audience. They're going to be... <laughs> Yeah, they're here in the YouTube studio. Um, <laughs> speaking of YouTube, let me reiterate this if you're listening and wondered why there was a sudden gigantic uh, addition of mid-roll ads in our YouTube videos. YouTube did mm. that, told me afterwards, and I went in and deleted all of them out, I think. I feel like I missed a few. It feels like a virus that I'm hunting down. Uh, there was like in an hour-long video, they put 14 mid-roll ads. Oh boy! So this is when you're in the you're in the middle of the video, and suddenly, just abruptly, it stops and and runs. Yeah, out. so that makes yeah. me want to punch something. Yeah. So we pulled those out. If you see them, please email me, and I'll get them out. It is not our intent to annoy people that much. Alrighty, let's talk about announcements. First of all, Kabuki Kids has thoughts on the TA4 expansion being a hundred bucks. Would it have been wiser for them to part it out in a few smaller pieces? This is a new Twilight Imperium Fourth Edition. They just announced it, and the Gen Con. Uh, an announcement the show for Fantasy Report. Flight, which basically yeah. was them talking about a bunch of expansions for things, and one new Marvel dice game, which looks like a reprint of Elder Signs. But anyhow, hmm. I digress. You can tell my enthusiasm there. <laughs> the TI4 expansion looks pretty cool. Yes, it's expensive. Yes, it's big. But I don't know. I feel like they can get away with this because anybody who's a fan of Twilight Imperium is not going to buy... It would have bought all the expansions they did anyway. Yeah, like the I think it needs TF4 to be epic. Love it. So. Yeah, yeah. Keep it to one product. Do you guys review, says Mr. Awesome, second editions of games and third editions? 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, actually, sometimes we just do a comparison. So like uh, in a week or so, I'm going to be doing a comparison of the new Sheriff of Nottingham to the first edition of Sheriff of Nottingham. Oh, okay. And we just, uh, in the mail yesterday, I got the new Seven Wonders, the new version of that. And I'll be doing a comparison to the old Seven Wonders, mostly because it's mostly just some very small differences. There's not a lot. It mm-hmm. all depends on how big of a change it is. Yeah. Some games, second edition is hugely different. Yeah, there. I mean, that's better in a video format. Sometimes it's it's hard to to really. You have to almost get into the nitty gritty when you're comparing a second edition to a first edition because usually the tweaks are very small, uh, if at all. Um, but if it's like a huge sweeping change, then sure, a comparison is good. But it, you also, again, need to be familiar with both editions. You have to be sort of uh, you know comfortable with the first edition, and then know immediately uh, what the differences are when it's been redone. Taman says, what do you think of players carrying over favors from previous games? <laughs> so me and Eric are playing, and Eric's like, Tom, I'll help you. I'm like, I'll remember that. Three days later, we're playing another game, and I say, Eric, remember that time? Yeah, you owe me. I don't like this. Here's the thing. I'm, not a, I, I'm actually opposed to carrying favors over from previous games. I'm not necessarily opposed to carrying over a grudge. Now, before you, before you, you're like, no, that's not, you should, that's called metagaming. Let me say this. If Eric lies to me and backstabs me in a game, and then we play another game, he's like, look, Tom, this time I'm telling the truth. I think I'm allowed to pull on my experience from the previous game. All right, but I mean, that's that's not necessarily a grudge. That's using your knowledge of the other players, which is But let's is say I do trust better. you again, and you backstab me again. And then we play another game, and I'm like, you know what? I don't know who to shoot here, so I'm shooting Eric, because I still remember what you did in those last two games. I think that's perfectly valid. Perfectly valid. Uh, yeah, I guess. Because <laughs> it's funny. Gator Dave wants to know, do you see online conventions becoming a staple in the future? They might. I I mean, they maybe not as a full replacement. I don't think you can do everything that a uh, a standard convention has done, but our uh, virtual gaming con I think went very well. And I think you can have these sort of virtual meetups possibly as an additional way to get together uh, for folks who who aren't able to travel as much. I could see this being a sort of an off-season additional event that that folks are doing in the future. It's it's hard to make it a full replacement for what is such a giant event like Gen Con. I might do a full video on this at some point because it's very interesting. Um, there's a lot of different factors involved here. First of all, introverted people tend to be happy. They like these online game cons. It's easier to get to know people. Um, secondly, while the software is good, it's just not completely there yet. Tabletop Simulator, and here Eric can talk about his wonderful experiences with it, yeah. has some problems. And it just, you know, whenever someone goes, it's not that hard to use, that means they've been using it for a really long time. That's true. There is a certain learning curve to Tabletop Simulator. And it is not a small one. And it's daunting. So unless you're playing a game on Steam and or iPads or Androids, whatever, Tabletop Simulator, Tabletopia, these things are daunting. And even finding and meeting other people, there's a technological hurdle. To this point, online conventions, the numbers are not even remotely the same as the actual real con. At least the online cons that I know the numbers of. Um, And the excitement just isn't as strong. Some of the stuff that's done is really weird. Like the Comic Con. So I went and watched a couple of the panels on Comic Con. They were all recorded ahead of time. Uh So what was the point of it? What was the point of putting up these, you know, just it was all pre-recorded panels. I can watch those today if I want. Yep. But now, they were they they premiered at a specific time. Yeah, but they also premiered like ten videos at, at, at every hour. <laughs> so it, again, it felt kind of weird yeah. in that regard. So I like 
the virtual con that, that we did with BGG, I liked that a lot. I thought that worked well, and I think that's a good you know, template to see what will happen in the future. I also liked what we did for the Summer Spectacular. I thought that was a lot of fun. You know, but we had one thing going on. We did some pre-recorded stuff, but we did a lot of live stuff to get people kind of in on the action and things. If if more cons do things like that, and I think Gen Con's doing a bit of that now. They got three channels going or something like that. Okay. With live stuff being done. That seems to work better, and we seem to be getting a bigger buzz there. But once those regular cons come back, I could see an online con becoming an offshoot, and I can see them working in the future. But I don't know. I just don't. I don't think they will overtake the big cons. I could be wrong. It could no. be a fuddy daddy at Lullite for saying that. But no, I mean they won't overtake it. But it, I think it is an outlet that that will appeal to some people who aren't as excited about braving the crowds of a big convention. Sure, um, and that's what I said at the beginning. I mean, I, I feel yeah. like that's there. I just don't know that it's a huge thing. Um, yeah. I I also. Like when I went to, so I went to the Gen Con online. I was like, all right, you know, what's there, what's there to see? And there's booths and stuff and I can click on a booth and look at the stuff, but it's just not the same as walking down a hallway. Yeah. Turning your eyes and seeing something and going, nope. And you keep walking (laughs) and then you see something else and you're like, ooh, and go in. And the buzz and seeing new games and stuff they have the games you can buy from Gen Con. You can go on in line and buy these games. But like, and there was a, someone, people were making lists of deals and stuff, but it was just not so easy to see. Hmm. It's just a little more inhibiting. And after a while, you're like, meh, I, I, I don't know if it's worth the time. Okay. Yeah, and I was uh, experiencing some, you know, overload on these virtual platforms. We talked about Tabletop Simulator, and and I, I went to Roy Kennedy was teaching me his new game, uh, Last Light, earlier this week because like it was announced at the beginning of the week, and he was immediately giving demos of it. Um, well, he's been working but, on this for a yes. really long time. Yes, and and very quickly, I liked what I saw, but it was a very early digital prototype, so I'm not even you know going to cover uh, the the final product. But it, I had a good time. But we kept getting booted from Tabletop Simulator because it was also the first day of Gen Con Online, and people were on there, and just gaming was in the air, and just constantly the server was getting overloaded. Um, and even for people who were comfortable with tabletop simulator and, and understanding the interface, we still had to wrestle with the technology because so many people wanted to use it. And a lot of these systems just aren't made for the flood of people that are hitting them. Sure. uh, But I mean, I think when they are, I mean, that's that, I I think that's a fixable problem. But again, I, 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 at around four today, I was like, oh yeah, that's right. Gen Con's going on. I forgot about it. You don't forget yeah. about Gen Con when you're there. Well, sure. And you also take off from work, and there's other things too, and the seeing of people. Yeah. So I I've think... been working this week. So yeah, it's uh, it's just it's a normal week. I, I I just sort of forgot about it at the time. Yeah, we'll see. All righty. Uh, Jeremiah says thoughts on Fantasy Flight's mutant insurrection game. He says really pop up men X Men pieces. I don't know. I mean, it looks interesting, but it looks like it's a riff on Elder Signs. Mm. And the pop-up pieces instead of miniatures, the standees with 90s art, it's okay. I mean, it's (laughs) certainly a game I would play. It's unfortunate it came out in the same world that the new Come On uh, Marvel game came out, and that's actually available mm-hmm. right now at Walmart for like thirty bucks. So, Are, is it still out? Because uh, their their email said that they had closed that particular loophole. They did for a brief moment in time, and it's now back out. And it's back. Okay. Also, you're going to start being able to buy. By the time you listen to this podcast, you probably can go online and buy it. All right. Well, I I, I should be getting mine soon. I'm just waiting by did the you door. You back it? I did. But you're going to get extra stuff later on. Sure, later. I should have reviewed that. Did I review it last time? I think I did. Uh, yes, you talked about it a couple weeks ago. All right. Uh, let's see here. What's your favorite game that comes in the smallest package? You know, on this note, I just got a pile. I, I, I got several games from Wallet, Button Shy Games. Mm. The Wallet ones. Yep. And so far, I found them to be decent 
bordering on okay. But the 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 two Sprawlopolis and Circle the Wagons are both amazing for the size yeah. of those games. Really, really good. And the new um, Infinity War love letter game is oh, okay. really good for how small it is too. Yeah, I mean those wallet games are great. Uh, Sprawlopolis is very good. Uh, Tussy Mussy is good. Um, I think I have to go a little bit bigger to the Tiny Epic games. Tiny Epic Galaxies is a tremendous favorite. Um, there's probably another deck of cards sized. Uh, the Mint games. Tiny Epic Galaxies are, is not small. You need to stop saying small. that. I mean, it's bigger than most decks of cards, so that's not. That's a... true. How about the the Paco Games games? Ooh, but it, you got to get the right ones. Yeah, like though not all of them are fantastic. Um, I Z like did Spy. A, Z did a video where he reviewed all of them, I think. Huh. Gator Dave then says, do you think Final Fantasy is making a mistake with a noticeable lack of original IPs in their games these days? Final Fantasy? Did I say Final Fantasy? Fantasy You Flight. did. I mix those up a lot. Okay. Uh, Fantasy Flight. So on one hand, I watched the video and I said, Oh, more X-Men stuff. Oh, more Armada stuff. Oh, more Legion stuff. Oh, more Kamara stuff. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Where's the new thing? Oh, it's also IP. And I could say to Tom Vassell, I wish they were making more stuff that I liked, more original games. And then I looked at the stream and saw 3,000 people watching it live. Yeah. I then noticed there were like four or five other streams with hundreds of viewers who were just restreaming it. And I thought, <laughs> I'm not sure they're making a mistake. They seem to be doing okay. Yeah. You can yeah. sit there and go, I can't believe you're doing this. And they're sitting there going, I can't hear you over the sound of all this money. <laughs> it could also be that as, you know, now that Fantasy Flight is part of a larger conglomerate, uh, that, that FFG is the, the IP you know, section money. This is their, this is the games that they produce. And maybe some of those more original products that would have been fantasy flight games, uh, before are now going off to another studio. Okay. Um, (laughs) you made your point. I get it. Land says as a game reviewer with family, does it get difficult to get your family involved to play a game that you need to review? (sighs) My son complained about this the other day when, uh, in fact, after we had been playing Control, and he's like, why can't we play a game that I already know how to play? You always have to do these new games. I'm like, well, yeah, I do have to, but I, I want to play something I know. Well, this is, this is my response to this. Yeah. Is, as with everything, if you want your children to do something, it's called options. I'll say something along the lines of, it's book reading time. Or... <laughs> you can play a game with you me. Play this game. It's time to clean out the garage. However, or alternatively, game. you can yeah. play a game. If you use this <laughs> optional method, they will think they are choosing and they'll be like, <laughs> Dad's a sucker. I like this idea. Um, and in reality, I try not to push it and I try to pick games that I think the kids will like. If I don't think they'll, well, I got a couple that will play pretty much anything. Um, but, uh, if I, if I think they'll, they won't like it, I won't ask a particular kid to play it. But every once in a while I do say, Hey, we're playing a game. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, across the board, but it's not that often. I don't have that much of a problem. Honestly, the kids have so much time on their hands right now. That it's not a th- it's it's really not an issue. I mean, I'm telling you, they have so much time. I've got more games played in my family this year than probably the last two combined, and it's only August. Plus, if one doesn't want to play, you have several other choices. That is correct, and I also have a ranking board of favorite child on the. No, I don't. I don't do that. <laughs> Most cooperative child. Oh, when you it comes moved to up two spots. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it saddens me, actually. My one child who refuses to play board games with me ever is going to college in less than a month. Oh, boy. I'm down two. All righty. Um, let's see. Is there a growing trend of conflict-free games? Psh, maybe in the last decade. <laughs> I mean, there's so many conflict-free games now because there's cooperative games are humongous. 
Sure. It, it, I mean, are they meaning something other other than cooperative games in conflict free? Are you talking like multiplayer solitaire style where you can do your own thing and not really be you're just trying to be more efficient than your opponents? I suppose. I don't know. Maybe that's what they mean. Um, I mean, sure, there are plenty of those. I don't think it's a trend, though. I think those have been around for a while. Um, Mr. Mike says, how much effort does it take for a company to participate in Gen Con online versus a normal convention? So, well, they're certainly learning how to do things that they haven't done before. That is correct. Some of them are like, we got to put a shirt on. Um, but yeah, so there, it's a... <laughs> It's a different <laughs> skill set. Well, no, some people are like, oh, we're going to be on camera with people. I can't lounge around in my pajamas all day. But they would have been wearing a shirt at a real convention, so that's not really different. No, but I'm, I'm saying it's different than their normal life. But yes, so they need to do a different skill set. You need to be able to to do video. You need to you know figure out how you're going to sell it. There's a lot of work. And in fact, some of, I saw one publisher uh, was saying, hey, one of the problems of doing an online con is you do the con and also everyone expects you to do your normal business that you do at the same time. <laughs> you know, like you, they would do like a demo for a game and then go to a business meeting right afterwards. At Gen right. Con, you don't have to, to do that sort of thing. So, well, but when you do have a meeting, you don't have to walk for 20 minutes through a crowd of people. There is that. There is that. You know, we would have eaten at that Japanese place today. Oh, we absolutely would have. Backers. I'm just saying. I was actually wondering how that, that particular restaurant is doing right now. I'm, I hope they're still around. Oh, the Ram is gone. What? I know. Ah, it's sad to oh, see. Boy. Wow. Well, wow, thanks for the bummer there, Tom. <laughs> All righty. Um... What backlash are people talking about? Any thoughts on the dead reckoning controversy? I don't know uh, what this is. Except no, I, I've seen people pulling out of their pledges for dead reckoning, but I don't know why. Well, I'll tell you this. So I backed it and I don't know a whole lot about it, but I do know that I got an, an email from him and they said, hey, just so you know, you've only backed for this pledge. You might want to consider upping to this other stuff because if you don't, you're not going to be able to have a chance to get it later on. You better do it right now. <laughs> okay. And I was like, oh, really? Delete. Because <laughs> <You know>, <laughs> I don't know. I, that, uh, that, yeah. that, the hard sales tactic does not work on me. It's a hard know? sell. Yep. So maybe that's what people are upset about because I, when, I, I when I just saw it, I was like, oh, yeah, well, no. You're lucky I don't go in there, kitten. And I just forgot about it. Maybe, maybe a lot of people thought the same way I did. Uh, you oh, gotta maybe. be careful when you sell people and stuff. I, I mean, there are some times where someone will, will call me or something, and they'll sell me and whatever, and, and I'll say, I don't know. They're like, Oh, I'm sorry to bother you. I'm like, No, look, it's okay. Sell me. You know, push, push your product. Come on. But I mean, don't get upset when I say no. But you don't need to apologize. Do the sell. Um. So. That's Dead Reckoning, which looks really fun from AEG. I'm pretty pumped about it. It's a Kickstarter, though, so we'll talk about it in a couple years. I just got hmm. my new Thunderstone stuff from AEG. Okay. <sighs> There's so much Thunderstone stuff, Eric. It's ridiculous. So when you say new Thunderstone stuff, you're talking about new Thunderstone Quest stuff or stuff That's for correct. Thunderstone Advance? They went okay. to level four heroes now, and there's tons of new heroes, tons of new weapons, tons of new stuff. Just tons. Okay. All righty. Well, we'll do one more question, and then we're going to jump to our top ten. Let me find a good question here. Um, yeah, well, actually, someone here mentioned maybe in a decade or so when you could design a purely affordable and accessible VR experience to walk through a virtual con, that would be amazing. And I agree. That's Futurama stuff. But, <laughs> but yes, that would be pretty cool. Wow. Can you imagine, like, manning a booth? In that way, you put on your VR headset, you just sort of stand there and watch people go by, try and wave <laughs> at them. And your kids are looking at you like, ah, oh, dad's trying to make friends again. Either either dad's at work in a booth or he's watching a tennis match. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Yeah. Oh, well. What do I know about the, okay, we'll talk about that. At the very end of the fantasy flight, 
uh, in-fight report, they they did a teaser for Descent. Oh. Now, 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 this did not work the way they intended it to. So if you were <laughs> watching the live stream, they uh, it kept messing up, which uh, made me feel yeah, bad I- for them. And on, on the other hand, I was like, well, if they mess up, <laughs> so do we. We're not the only ones. Okay, but anyway, so internet problems. So they just recorded it and then posted it a few hours later. Mm-hmm. And at the very end, he stood up and he's like, woof. That's done. And then he pulled out this giant cube box of the scent. He's like, oh, I wish I could have talked about this. And then someone shouts, you're still alive. We're still in here. And then the video cut, which would have worked better had it actually been live. <laughs> One of the cool things about pre-recording stuff, and Eric and I both know this, mm-hmm. is you can pull things out if you need to. Unless, yes. of course, in the case of this episode where we actually are recording it live. Right. But, <laughs> Anyhow, I'm I'm super excited about a new descent. I don't know what anything else about it. It boggles my mind that they did not use Gen Con as a good way to tell us about all this. Maybe all they have is the box. They haven't decided on anything. <laughs> There's nothing else. else inside it. To like That's make a big it. box that will get people excited. We'll go from there. <laughs> we have a whole year to come up with what goes in the box. Next Gen Con. All righty. Well, that's enough questions for now. We'll go back to the questions that you all send us in our next episode. Um, But for now, let's get to that top 10. Getting in some oxygen. Let's see what people will say. Tom, I've been craving Chinese food. Yeah, but Chinese food is the big thing about PAX because PAX is in Chinatown. That's really cool. Mmm. Uh, losing Corey Canesco is a huge loss. Actually, yeah, it's really weird to watch the fantasy fight and not see Christian Peterson, Corey Canesco, Andrew Navarro. I don't know any of these people. That doesn't mean it's a bad thing. I just don't know any of them. And also watching them do it from their studio in masks just felt very deflating compared to the excitement of a thousand people. Like they would talk about the X-Wing stuff and I'd like, I'd be like, oh, all the people would be screaming right now. Oh oh, yeah, they're not here. (laughs) All right, I am rolling once again. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Keep those doggies. I gotta pull up the script. Oh yeah, um, I think we need to redo the italicizing. All right, hang on, I'll get on it. Okay. Nobody italicizes like Tom Vassell. Nobody. He's been doing it for years. Like Tom Vassell. Oh, he also changes his top 10 lists sometimes. <laughs> I saw one on Eric's list. I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I need to and only that. you watching live have the proof. They don't have the proof. It's just you saying it. Wait a minute. Why are all mine behind yours? <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of crossover, and Tom's not going to talk a lot for this episode. Well, some people are happy when that happens. But there's also some ridiculously good games that Eric didn't put on his list again. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's fun. All right, it's time for our um, a letter. Oh, wait, not with pirates. Pirates a lot for some reason. Uh. Anyhow, um, we're gonna talk about. We've been going through this, and I've enjoyed this. I know some people are not as huge fans, but it's fun to talk about games we may not often mention, although. It was pretty easy. Some letters are easier than not, and we're about to go through three of those in a row. R-S-T. Um, L-N-E. Wheel of Fortune. So we're going to do R today, uh, and it's not Wheel of Fortune. It's Wheel of of Fortune. Fortune. All right. Anyway, let's go with our favorite R games, starting with Eric. Let's start with the most giant of all of the uh, Martin Wallace Railways games, Railways of the World. Uh, I like this variant. Uh, It's a little more, it's a little less punishing than, say, Age of Steam or the the hardcore version of of Steam. Um, And it it is super produced. It's got a gigantic board. It's got these big plastic uh, markers that are just for when, you know, markets are done. It's like, this location is closed. It's got a giant water tower on it now. Um, But it's still a solid game with lots of variant maps that are all just as giant. Um, Cool game. Railways of the World by number 10. Alrighty. Well, in that 
interestingly enough, it changed its name, but had it kept its original name, Railroad Tycoon, still would have made the list. It would have been on this list. My number 10, I actually was thematic with this one and crossed off my original one and changed it to this one. And now it's something different, which we'll talk about later. Well done. Number nine is a small card game uh, called Red 7, a game where the scoring conditions are constantly changing. And at the end of every and when you play a card, you have to be winning or you are out. And so you have to change the scoring condition or change the cards in front of you in order to be winning according to that sto- uh, scoring condition. And that is a tricky mental leap to make. And I like that challenge. Red 7, number 9. My number 9 is uh, on Eric's list. One of these days I'll beat him. Number eight uh, was Tom's number 10. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm back. Yes, Risk Legacy. Um, I, I mean, this is the granddaddy of the Legacy games. This is the first one to do it, taking a very simple game and then adding these extra layers as the system changes. And that concept was so fascinating. And while this isn't one that I, I would want to play a ton, although I, I must say I do have a set that is waiting for my children to be ready to play it. I have a, a un, unopened box of Risk Legacy that I'm, I'm looking forward to playing with them. Uh, the, the I saw this at uh, Barnes & Nobles the other day. Really? Yeah. It, it so they're was, still making some. That's I, cool. I guess, or there's just a big stock of it somewhere. I, I That's interesting. Um, it, it, it Just the experience of having, you know, opening up those envelopes for the first time, uh, triggering something that's going to open a new package. That was such a rush when uh, when we first were doing it. And uh, so that experience over those 15 games is why Risk Legacy is my number eight. I really like it, too. Uh, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, folks. This is a little advertisement come by the YouTube channel this week. I'm going to rank all the legacy games that I've played, which is almost all of them. Okay. Um, I got this done now with the new pandemic coming out. You'll see where that fits in the list. And mm. uh, But Risk Legacy, I like almost all the legacy games, so that's not a surprise. But Risk Legacy really is solid. It still is the first. It still surprised me in an unbelievable way when I opened it up and I was just like, What? There's a box I can't see yet. You know, that was just fascinating. (laughs) So, yeah, I also like Risk Legacy, my number 10. My number eight is sort of a tie. It's Raiders of the North Sea, but Raiders of the North Sea was just remade this year as Raiders of Scythia. Hmm. Um, It's essentially a 2.0 version of Raiders of the North Sea, but I like them both. I especially like Raiders of the North Sea with its expansions. If Raiders of Scythia gets one expansion, I don't know. But in this game, you are placing workers. It's a neat mechanism where you place a worker and pull a worker, and you get the actions of both, and you're loading up your ships full of Vikings and sending them out to plunder and loot. And I just, I like this game. It won the Kenner Spiel for good reason. Fantastic Hmm. game. Raiders of the North Sea, or later on this year, Raiders of Scythia. My number seven, we talked about just a couple weeks ago in our fauna games, and that's Reef Encounter, uh, the game with the parrotfish, and you're eating the coral, and there's a ranking of which coral can eat other coral, and, you know, listen back two episodes. It's my number seven here, because it starts with R, Reef Encounter. Reef Encounter, great game. It just, there's so many good games to put on my list. My number sure. seven, one I really think Eric would like. Have you not played this one? No, I do like it. I'm, I'm, I have to. I don't have my short list in front of me. I think this is probably my number eleven. This it's is just always on the, the cop out. Always no, number I eleven. Whereas, you, I have no. You have no proof. <laughs> yeah, we use this all the time. Whenever we have a guest in the show, I say, "Listen, if you forget your number ten, remember it's your number eleven. <laughs> number eleven. Uh, Res Arcana. Res Arcana. Despite having, I think, actually a fairly mundane theme, Res Arcana." shows how less can be more it's mm-hmm. a very small engine building game that's super smooth super fun so easy and yet feels tight and interesting and it's going to feel different each time because you have a different hand of cards to work with i like it a lot and this oddly enough is one of three games by the same designer on this <laughs> list Yes, indeed. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure why, you know, I'd have to think back to to why I didn't put this on here, because I agree with everything you just said. It is a very nice streamlined game, um, and, and the puzzle of how you're going to deal with those, what is it, eight cards, 
uh, in your initial deck? Um, and, and which ones do you want to build first? Which ones are fodder at the beginning? What's my plan over the course of the game is, is very cool in Ray's Arcana. Number six, I referenced uh, earlier in the show when I was talking about control, and that is oh, that Runix. was a clue. Was I yes. supposed to be writing these down? You should have. It was. It was a. Uh, it was foreshadowing. Mm. Um, Rumus has a, a similar victory condition uh, to control. The object at the end of Rumus is to have as many of your pieces showing uh, from the top when you're all done. Um, and but all the pieces in Rumus are different. They're all polyominoes or 3D uh, polyominoes uh, and and your your positioning you can only build off of your own pieces so you don't want to get blocked off there are height limits on the board as you build around and so covering up things and being visible by the end of the game is important Rumus is a is a great tactile game and my number six Rumus is fun just not a top 10 in this category for me my number six is Iron Eric's list blah 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 he went first Number five was Tom's number nine, and that yeah, is the war game with the adorable forest creatures known as Root. Red Wall. Uh, oh, Root, sorry. Yeah, yes. Uh, g- lovely game. Difficult learning curve, um, but but so cool in, in how each faction feels different, and you, you have a different experience behind the wheel of each of those different factions. I, I love it. I, I have not played all the factions, and I really I want to. Root. Number five. Root is a fantastic game. It's I know some people are probably thinking it's too low on both of our lists, but the fact of the matter <laughs> is this game for me has a point deducted against it. In fact, there is a game on the people's choice that's not on my list that has the same reasoning, and that is because it is so hard to get this to the table mm. because either no one's played it before and I have to teach all the rules in Root, which is a lot of work, or everyone has played it before and I'm just prepared to sit there and get destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Hard to find that sweet. Yeah. All right. My number five. Why is higher in Eric's list? I think that's the last one to do that, though. Okay. Fine. Okay. Number four. It was Tom's number five. What? So he didn't even have to wait that long. Uh, it's Race for the Galaxy. Um, the the lovely Tom Lehman game uh, where you're the cards have multiple uses. Um, you are choosing a a role at the beginning of, of every turn and uh, only the roles that have been chosen are going to trigger and trying to build your tableau and get synergies amongst your cards. There's so many cool interactions in the way these cards work together. The system is solid and a lot of fun. Race for the Galaxy, number four. Yeah, Race race for the Galaxy, um, which was my number five. Just a fantastic game. Another game designed by Tom Lemon, who did Res Arcana. Um, I like... Uh, Eric, you did this. You messed me up on how I can talk about this stuff. So I'm going <laughs> to come back. I mess you up. Okay. Be, because uh, I'm, I'm going to come back and talk about Race for Galaxy later on. Oh. Hmm. My number four is Rajas of the Ganges, which is a very underrated but amazingly cool uh, board game, a uh, dice placement game in which you have these two tracks, a money track and a points track, and they're going in opposite directions, and if they cross each other, you win. So you can hmm. work on just one track or the other. Um, but it has it's it's definitely point salad through and through. It's pretty point salad, though. And I really like this one. Uh, definitely a keeper, Rajas of the Ganges. It, it is a solid game. I've only played one time. So, you know, amongst all these others that I've, I've played more often, it, it just didn't quite rise to the top. But it is a very good game. Number three, just to make sure Tom understands, this is Reef. With nothing else after it. So Reef, which is the Emerson Matsuchi game, the abstract, building up your coral with the cool plastic chunky pieces and building an engine to try and, uh, you know, add more coral and score the same coral and then set up for your next move as well and getting that thing rolling to earn points. It's delicious fun. Reef, number three. So you're a succinct man. Yes. The more the fewer words, the more you like it. Reef encounter, good. Take the encounters <laughs> away. Just reef better, it better, even better. Yes, but you'll notice that uh, if you were listening two weeks ago to our fauna list, reef encounter was more of a fauna game than reef. So they were actually flip flopped in the other list. That's true. Reef is a great game, though. Good choice, Eric. Yay. My number three is role player. 
a game in which you roll up a D&D character, has an amazing expansion, actually two expansions, um, and in this game it's dice placement. You're going to be drafting dice and placing these dice on your character, trying to get different stats, using the dice in different ways. It does not sound like a game that would appeal to anyone except those who like role-playing games, but I feel like I can safely say you can dislike role-playing games and still enjoy this. Sure. It's a solid game. It's often compared to Sagrada. I like this one much better. I feel like it has a lot of cool strategic choices. That is role player. That's R-O-L-L. Yes. Role and uh, another great choice. Uh, and again, one that I haven't played enough to really uh, rise to we the top We are being of. so nice to each other today. Yeah, well, it's a good game. Number two Garbage. is a game where you're no, sorry. super <laughs> nice. To the other players, uh, Robo Rally is the uh, robot programming game uh, where you are moving through a maze and shooting at the other players and trying to tag flags faster than the opponents. Um, I, I still adore this one. Um, I, I think it's so much fun to send Twonky off a cliff or actually not. If I'm Twonky, then I'm pushing someone else off a cliff. Good times for Robo Rally, my number two. Good choice, and this one made my top 10 for ours, I'm sure, years ago, but mm. it just got bumped off. My number two is Into Raccoon Tycoon. Really love this game, and in fact, there's like a sequel sorts of, of sorts right now on, on uh, Kickstarter called Wizard Lizard or something like that, or Lizard Wizard. Lizard Wizard, yeah. I don't know much about that, although it looks very similar. Raccoon Tycoon is a game, it's a little bit of a stock market style game, where you, but it's really fast. In fact, it's very similar to an Emerson Matsuchi game. It reminds me of Reef in a way. You know, you just take a couple actions on your turn. You're going to increase stocks. You're going to put some stuff up for auction and, or sell different uh, goods, different resources. It is a fantastic game. Highly recommend it. Raccoon Tycoon. Uh, another one that's got a great system uh, and, and one, you know, one action from a player can really affect everybody else. If somebody sells a commodity and drives the price down just as you're getting ready to do the same or the opposite, seeing someone is about to make a ton of points on a commodity and be like, well, I've got two of these. Yeah, I'll sell. And then you see the fuming from across the table. You are yes. a bitter Bitter man. What? No. I'm gonna do a list of Eric's bitter game experiences. Uh, that would that would be great. It would be delightful to go through those again. Please. Number one, set it off. All right. <laughs> anyway, what's your number one? Number one, Tom was uh, referencing or alluding to earlier. It was his number six, and that's Roll for the Galaxy. I prefer the dice version of uh, Tom Lehman's system, although this was Tom Lehman and Wei Hua Huang uh, as co-designers. And it's the dice version of Race for the Galaxy. I, I like the um, the manipulation of the dice. I sort of like the reordering of the actions in the game. Um, it just appeals to me just a little bit more. Um, but still it has that crazy variation and the way that the dice all work together and the planets and the synergies and the um, engine building. It's it's fun. It's a grand old time. Roll for the galaxy, my number one. Uh, it's good. I just like Race for the Galaxy better. And I was trying to say that <laughs> earlier, then realized that Eric kind of talked about roll yet, and it was confusing. And then you had to be made secretive. These rules? It was me, yeah. and so I can't really get mad about the way the rules are. Yeah. All right. But roll for the galaxy, race for the galaxy. I kind of waffle back and forth. I've been playing way more race lately, so that's why that one's I like better. But roll is still okay. quite good. I've been playing a lot more roll lately, so yes. Isn't the roll for the galaxies on beta for iPad, right? So the that, the app, yeah, yeah. So when that comes out as a fully fledged app, maybe I'll change my tune. I've been playing it; it's fun. My number one is Rising Sun, the fantastic game from Come On, the sequel to Blood Rage, uh, the prequel to. Uh, whatever the one that's coming in it, out not is. Innis. Um, uh, not in it. That's uh, Innis is the the Matigo. It's the new one from. Uh, anyway, um, Ankh. 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 Is it? it was right. a, it was an A. It was yeah, Ankh. Uh, Rising Sun. I love it. It's like uh, it's like if I if I was redesigning diplomacy, this is what I would want it to look like. So a lot of fun, a lot of cool miniatures, giant monsters. That's my number one. It looks very pretty. Let's take a look at the People's Choice, number 10 for the people. By the way, if you're listening, you can always go vote in our People's Choice by going to Dicetower.com and voting there. Number 10 is Res Arcana. Um, okay, cool. Number 9, Robo Rally. 
they're still with us. Number eight, Raiders of the North Sea. Number seven, The Resistance. Good choice. This one missed my list, but I can see why people really like it. Mm-hmm. Although lately, I've now that I have that online werewolf group, it's really... <laughs> That's where you get werewolf. your fix these days? It really, really does. It's so good. Hmm. Um, number five, Rising Sun. Number four is Robinson Crusoe Adventure on the Cursed Island. Now, this is the one I was talking about earlier that missed my list. Yep. And we just recently played this with Ignacy Trebicek on mm. uh, and Summer Spectacular, and we lost spectacularly. Trying <laughs> I to... think he enjoys when that happens. He really does. But I'll tell you what, I'm so glad he was there because I can never remember all the rules of this game. Mm. And so I like it a lot, but it's just so hard to get to the table. You know, it feels like almost work getting through that. Now, if Ignacy Trebicek could come packaged in the box, that would be a <laughs> felony. But also, yeah, very helpful. Yeah, I think I'm getting ready to let this one go. I, I it just hasn't hit the table, and and you don't it, want to teach I, I it to your kids, right? Because you're and afraid of what it. will happen. Yeah. Back to people's choice number three, Root. I actually expected Root to be number one. Number two, Roll for the Galaxy. Number one, Race for the Galaxy. So that people agree with me. They do. Of course, Race has a little bit of a head start, so it's winning the race. That's not how that works because it nowadays is. people vote for the newer game and no one laughs at stupid puns. No one laughs at stupid puns? Actually, if what? that's true, don't, uh, don't stay on for the uh, end credits. Oh, no. Everything <laughs> I know is wrong. <laughs> Oh, well. All right, folks. Well, that's it for another episode. We will be back in two weeks. Bud, Mandy, and Suzanne will be back next week. So it'll be good to hear from them. Always, You can always talk to us both on Facebook and on our Board Game Geek Guild. Lots of great discussions these days. I'm having a lot of good times. I'll read some stuff, and I'll be like, what kind of fool said that? Then I'll realize I'm not on the Dice Tower Facebook group. And I'm like, ah, I should be going there. Fewer fools. So, fewer fools. Fewer fools. That's our motto. Yes. The Dice Tower. Fewer, fewer fools. fools. <laughs> yeah. All righty, folks. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. I'm just saying, if I'm not here in two weeks, it's because no one laughed at my stupid pun. So you're like, how would you know, though? Do you want people to send you a, a forum to just go, ha, ha, ha? I'm a... <laughs> Dearest Eric, ha, ha, ha. P.S. Ho, ho. <laughs> no, I'll know. I'll know. And that is a wrap. All right, folks who are watching on the video, we're glad you came by. And it looks like my idea of starting at 830 and going to 10 worked well. Wow, we're right on time. It is weird. So you got an extra... Um, I'll st we'll stick around and talk to you for five more minutes for those people yeah, who shut up sure. in nine. Don't feel cheated. But then I'm I'm going off because yeah. I am about to watch Umbrella Academy season two. Oh, I'm, I'm maybe I can play some Dragon Quest. Which one? I uh, eleven. Was that a new one? That's the I think that's the latest one. Um, I I did not remember uh, PS4. I did not remember how long Dragon Quest games are. Like do you they do all the side long. quests and build up your characters forever? I mean, there are there are side quests that I've been doing. I, I haven't been spending like a ton of time not following the main, even just following the main plot. I have been playing for a long time. Um, but yes, it's uh, it's uh, I've been enjoying it for sure. But even after the game is over, when the, it's like the end and the credits roll, the game's still going on. There's still there's like a whole act three going on. So I'm still in that. That sounds like spoilers. It, it, okay, but it's not really, I mean, the other game I played, the long one, Dragon Quest VIII, also when the game was over, there was still more to do. I think that's just sort of a, it's weird how familiar it is. A lot of elements are like, oh yeah, I remember that, that slime. Wait, which one? And, okay, so the one I played, I only played one, and that's where the princess was a horse. That was eight. I liked it a lot. That was PS2, yep. I believe. That was, yes. Yeah, this um, one's very similar, like, in, in gameplay to that, um, but I, I think I like the story even better. Oh, how is Slay the Spire going? I may be Slayed the Spired out. 
Um, uh. I have been whooping on it lately. I've gotten really good at it. <laughs> uh, when you, I haven't played it enough to get good at it. I, I sort it of wonder much, about. Well, I may have gone overboard. It was, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, are you playing on on iOS or are you playing on Switch? On the iOS. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes things work better on one or the other. Like I downloaded that. Oh, I forget what it's called. It's a creation type game where like you'll click two things together like water and sand and you'll get mud and you keep going until you you've created everything on earth do you know what i'm talking about you mix uh, two things vaguely yeah so i played that game oh doodle god i think or something i don't remember what it's called anyway i played it on the ios and then that was on a switch and i was like "Ooh, cheap price i'll get it and then i was like ah, it's so much faster to do that touch than it is to go through the menus on the switch oh uh, okay yeah Dungeons and Dragons Quest 9.7? I didn't even know they had decimal points. Dungeons and Dragons Quest 9.7? Mr. Oz, dude, said, I'm currently playing Slay the Spire on Ascension level 20 with the defect. I I got to, like, Ascension level 5, and then I was like, you know what? This is just the same thing over and over again. Then I wanted to see how fast I could kill myself, and it was kind of hard, actually. <laughs> Move on to Monster Train, even better than Slay the Spire? Mm, I don't know if I need more addiction. But what if you want a railroad theme? With monsters. Is, uh, it, a, is it a railroad line run by monsters? I don't know. It's called Monster Train. Is it for the iOS? Oh, it's not for the iOS. Okay, woof. Oof, or okay or is then. it like a command you give to monsters that you are coaching? Monster train! And then the monster trains. Rocky montage. Uh, let's see. Uh, Eric will be... Eric will be doing... Um, Dice Tower Tonight soon, right? Is that this Wednesday? Uh, the following yeah, Wednesday? This, this coming Wednesday is uh, Dice Tower Tonight with Crystal. All righty, so come back. I'm not then. sure what, what our topic's going to be, but we'll be here. All righty. Well, all right, folks, that's it. It's 10. We're ending. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll, this podcast will go live Tuesday morning. Until then, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Merrick Summer. We'll talk to you all later. Bye. Bye.